Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. There we go. Okay. So uh, before we start, well, first of all, thanks for coming. Uh, before uh, Sheikh Saad uh, talks today, we're just going to have a brief introduction to the MSA. So the MSA, the Muslim Student Association. So who are we exactly? Well, the MSA is a club that's a resource, and we're a resource in three different ways. Number one, we are a resource religiously. Um, through our events, you can learn more about Islam and hopefully get closer to Allah. That's our goal. Number two, we're also a mental resource. If you need any type of you know, mental relief, uh, mental therapy, you need to talk to someone, maybe talk to someone of Islamic knowledge, MSA has been there for years and will continue being there for that. And lastly, we are also a social resource. Many people have met their best friends through the MSA. We have a roster of hundreds of people, so you'll definitely meet someone who's just like you. So we do have a few exciting announcements. The first is Muslim Weekly. What's Muslim Weekly? <laughs> so Muslim Weekly is a newsletter that comes out once a week. Uh, it contains one or both of the following. Number one, it'll talk about a variety of topics of, uh, in Islam, uh, one topic per week. Examples are why it's important to have patience in your life, or why Allah promises us more when we have gratitude, things of the sort. And number two, it'll shed Islamic light on controversial issues. For example, uh, what types of jewelry are permissible in Islam? What kinds of piercings are okay? Is gold okay? Things like that. So if you are interested, uh, you can text Muslim Weekly without any vowels to 81010. Again, that is Muslim Weekly, no vowels. 81010. This is going to be up here for a short period of time, but we're going to have this on the, on the slide during the dinner, so you can sign up during that time. And how it works is, is okay. how it works is essentially uh, once a week you'll get a text with a link, and you follow that link, and then you'll be brought to the page of MSA week, of Muslim Weekly. Next, we have our MSA shirts designed by our wonderful sister Armana Islam. As you see, it's a glitched, black, glitched Arabic logo. It says Yukon in the front in Arabic, and then our logo in the back. So the normal price is $20, but if you pre-order, the pre-orders are open until October 31st, um, you'll get 25% off, and it'll be $15. So if you're looking at this, and you really like it, I recommend going on Facebook very soon, and filling out the form, filling out your information, and Venmoing Yukon MSA. $15. And as soon as we get the supply, we'll get it to you, inshallah. So that's just a close-up of the front, and that's a close-up of the back. Okay, so now we're talking about the Halal initiatives. So I'm sure we all know that uh, Towers is the only dining hall on campus with Halal food. And considering how many Muslims there are on campus, uh, it would be great if we had a second dining hall with Halal. Don't you guys agree? Yeah, and it's a nod, yeah. Yeah, because you know, Tower is a little off, you know, something more central would be fantastic. So that's what this is for. If you signed in at the front of the table, there was a petition form. Uh, the more, essentially, the more signatures we get, the more likely it is that this is gonna happen. Inshallah, we wanna see this happen within the next year or two. Um, so if you actually haven't signed, it's gonna be at that table back there. And the black table is not there yet, but it will be. If you haven't signed it, uh, just make sure that you are a UConn student, an undergraduate, yeah, that's it. Yeah, okay. Okay, so I'm sure we all know who this guy is. Uh, Hassan Minaj is coming to UConn next Saturday, October 12th. So uh, we shot him an email, you know, him being Muslim and everything. We wanted to see if he'd collaborate with the MSA with a meet and greet. And when we shot this email, we didn't really expect a response. But he responded. And he's down for it. So we're having an MSA meet and greet with Hassan Minaj on October 12th. There's a few requirements though. You can only come if you have a ticket to the show. Because <laughs> it's gonna be backstage after the show. 
And he wants it to be a very limited amount of people. He only wants 20 people. So this is how we're going to do this. It's going to be, uh, there's going to be a form on Facebook. You fill that out, fill out all, all your information. Then you write how much you pledge to donate to the MSA. Now this is going to be an auction type thing. So the top 20 pledges, well after it's been, after we release the form and once it's been stopped, we'll get the ticket essentially. And this, uh, we'll put all the pledges public. So you can see the number one pledge and the 20th pledge, and if you want to pledge somewhere in between there to be on the list, you can. And if you check later and you find that your pledge has gone off the list, you can submit another form and do another pledge of a higher amount if you want to, if you want to do that. So we're going to put out the form this weekend, and it's going to stop on Thursday. So if you're on that list, we're going to email you with the instructions on how to participate in this. Okay. So now uh, MSA is hosting a 5K, and we're actually going to have Sister Sawera uh, come on stage and talk about this. Thanks, Sam. Um, Assalamu alaikum, everyone. My name is Sawera Hassan, and I'm the Helping Hand for Relief and Development Deputy Regional Manager, and I'm also on the MSA board. I'm here to announce the, um, the Helping Hand and MSA will be hosting the 5K for Kashmir at UConn to collect funds for the K Kashmir Relief Fund, which is organized by Helping Hand for Relief and Development. Since the Indian government has placed 8 million people in the Muslim-majority territory of Kashmir under a complete military lockdown for the past 59 days, no humanitarian or relief agency has been allowed to enter or provide aid to the people of Kashmir. There is a shortage of food, water, and medical supplies. Curfews have been imposed. All internet and tele telecommunication lines are cut, and nightly raids, arrests, torture, and the use of pellet guns have increased. We believe it is our responsibility to help our Muslim brothers and sisters in Kashmir, and have decided to collaborate with Helping Hand to join them and provide, as they provide relief to Jammu and Kashmir. The 5K will be on Saturday, November 2nd, from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. on Fairfield Way. Registration is now live, so please go purchase your tickets for only $10. All proceeds from the 5K will go to the Kashmir Relief Fund to assist the vulnerable communities in Jammu and Kashmir. Jazakallah khair. Thank you, Sarah. Okay, so now we're actually going to break from Maghrib, but before we do that, um, if anyone has any questions about anything regarding the MSA Church, the Hassan Minaj meet and greet, anything, uh, you can come and talk to me about it, or uh, Sister Mushira. So now we're going to have Maghrib, inshallah, in a few minutes. Assalamu And as soon as we're done with Maghrib, actually come back to the tables, because then Sheikh Saad, inshallah, will be talking about it. A little bit about him. Uh, he was born and raised in the USA. Uh, he obtained a bachelor's with a major in design and a minor in psychology from the University of Maryland. Uh, he then went on to study at the University of Medina. Uh, there he obtained a diploma in Arabic language and a bachelor's in Islamic law. Uh, since graduating from the University of Medina, he has been traveling all across the globe as an instructor for Al Maghrib Institute, public speaker and lecturer. He has a wide following among the youth all across the world, and he has an uncanny ability to connect with the younger generation. Apart from his public speaking, he has also launched his own clothing line. And I've seen it myself, and it is pretty fresh. <laughs> okay, so during the lecture, you think of any questions to ask Sheikh. Uh, you can text this number an anonymous question. This isn't his actual number, so don't text him later on. But it'll appear on the phone in front of him, and then inshallah at the end, he will uh, read all the questions. So without further ado, I welcome to the stage, Sheikh Saad Taslim. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man wala Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh Okay, um, so if you don't know what the topic is uh, the topic that was given to me was hustle culture versus baraka culture um, I think it's an awesome topic, alhamdulillah I didn't come up with that title 
I'm not sure I would have phrased it like that, uh, but I think this topic is definitely uh, an important topic. So what we're really talking about here is, like if you break it down to its, its roots, it's the fundamentals, we're talking about hustle as in like putting in work, right? Versus baraka, uh, how does baraka affect that work that we do? So I would imagine that most people like as we go through life, we're told that you work hard um, and you stay consistent and you're persistent and then eventually you will see results. Whether it's in like academia, right? So in your studies, you're told, you know, work hard in college and stay persistent and you'll do well in college and then you'll get a good job and then life will be great. Um, whether it be our health, so like in terms of like working out, uh, you're told, you know, put in the work, uh, eat healthy, go to the gym, take care of yourself, and you will see results. As a Muslim, we add in another factor into that work, and that is what is known as baraka. So normally we would say, you put in the work, you put in the time, and that equals success. As a Muslim, we would say, not necessarily the case. There is an additional factor which needs to be part of it, and if it is not, then we may be missing out on true success. And that missing factor is baraka. So we would say you put in the time, you put in the effort, and you add baraka to what you are doing, and that is the only way that you're going to see true and proper and fulfilling success. So before I go any further, I want to first talk about what baraka actually is. Now, baraka, if you look at it linguistically, uh, it comes from, so they would say an animal, uh, baraka al-ba'ir, like an animal did baraka. What that means is, it's a verb that means it would sit down, or it would rest in a place, or establish itself in a, in a place. Um, also, uh, there's an Arabic word uh, known as birka. Birka is basically a small pond uh, or a small body of water. And the meaning is actually similar because in a pond or, or a body of water, the water is established there. So when we say baraka in terms of like spiritually, what does baraka mean? We mean that this is a, a when, we, when we ask for baraka in something, we want that goodness is established within it. But not just any goodness, rather goodness that comes from Allah. And there's a hadith mentioned in Sahih Bukhari and Sahih Muslim in which the Prophet said, he said, Al-Baraka min Allah. He said, Baraka comes from Allah. So the goodness that we're talking about, we attribute it to God. And say, you know, God, we, when we ask for Baraka, we're saying, oh Allah, put goodness in this endeavor or this matter or this time or whatever it may be. The second meaning of baraka is actually to uh, increase and grow, right? So something gets better, it increases, it grows. So for example, uh, we have the hadith of the Prophet uh, in which he made uh, dua for the companion uh, Abdurrahman ibn Awf. And he, the dua he made for him is, is that he said, Barakallahu laka fi malik wa ahlik. He said, may Allah put baraka in your mad, your wealth, and your ahl, meaning your family. So what the Prophet ﷺ is asking for here is two things. And that's the two meanings we spoke about. Number one is that goodness is established in his wealth, and goodness is established in his wealth, in his family. The second meaning is that it grows and it, and it increases. So when we say Barakallahu laka fi malik, may Allah bless you in your wealth, meaning may Allah give you more. May Allah increase it, but not just any type of increasing, but an increasing or an increase that has goodness in it. And that is why, uh, by the way, uh, I know a lot of times uh, we hear, we, when we see something good or nice, uh, we're often told that we should say, MashaAllah, right? So if you like compliment somebody, like you're like, hey, nice shirt, um, the person may reply and say, hey, say mashallah. Right, has this happened to you? Yes? Why are they saying that? 
Because they're afraid of what? Evil eye, right? Aib, or as Daisy say, Nazar, right? And so people often say, like, you know, you should say, MashaAllah. And um, in actuality, that is, and I hate to break it to you tonight, but that is actually incorrect. You're not supposed to say, MashaAllah. Uh, MashaAllah, and by the way, this misconception, it comes from Surah Al Kahf. Where two people, and if you read Surah al Kaf or you, you heard it, um, one person, uh, uh, a person, uh, the person who has a garden, um, the other man, which some scholars say is his brother, um, both of them had gardens, so his brother, he says to him, because he was getting arrogant, he was getting proud of the garden, and he was attributing, attributing uh, the garden to himself, like as if he put in the work and therefore he has a garden and therefore like he deserves it. And so um, the, the, the other man, he says to him, That if you were to only that when you enter your garden, you say, MashaAllah, it is by the will of Allah, La quwwata illa billah. There is no power or might other than Allah. So this is where you often hear people say like Masha Allah, La Quwata Illa Billah. In actuality, if you look at what is happening here in this story, it wasn't an issue of like envy, right? Which is how we use it, right? So it's like, hey, don't get jealous of me or don't get envious of me, say Masha Allah. Right? That's why I don't know if you've been to like Muslim countries, but on like their possessions that they that they like, they'll often like put Masha Allah. So if you get like a new car. They have like a big like sticker on the back that says MashaAllah. So when you see the car, you automatically say MashaAllah. It's like, oh, you can't give me evil eye. Or like people get a get a new house and write and like on the gate of the house, the front door, it says MashaAllah. And it's supposed to like prevent people from getting like jealous or, or envious of, of their house. Um, so that is how it is used. But in the Quran, we see it wasn't an issue of jealousy. The man wasn't jealous of the garden. The problem was, was arrogance, and that was attributing the garden or, or, or you know, his success to himself rather than, than Allah. And so if you look at the teachings of the Prophet Muhammad he actually told us what to say. He said that if you fear that you will be envious of someone or that you may give them evil eye, you, you should ask Allah to put barakah in what they have. I'll say that once again. Prophet Salaam instructed us that if we fear that we would be jealous or actually we should say envious of someone's possessions or something that they have, we should say, we should ask for Allah to put barakah in whatever they have. So what that means is like, um, I like someone's car. I say, hey, nice car. May Allah put barakah in your car. Right? May Allah, and you know, usually we translate that as blessings, right? So may Allah bless you in your car. And so that is the correct usage. So what we are saying here is that if we were to say to someone, like, hey, nice shirt or nice outfit, um, and we say, you know, may Allah put barakah in it, we're, ask, we're actually asking Allah to increase in their goodness and give them even more. So what that does is it automatically negates our feelings of envy and jealousy. So if you're, if you're envious of, of a possession that someone has, and you force yourself to actually make dua for them, which is what it is to, to say, may Allah bless you, right? may Allah get, uh, put blessings in your possession, this dua means you have to fight your negative feelings and say, may Allah bless you, and also meaning may Allah increase you. And oftentimes, you know, when it, when it comes to envy, one of the feelings associated with envy is like, this person doesn't deserve this, or they shouldn't have this. Sometimes people feel like, I should have it, this person doesn't deserve it. And that concept, by the way, is known as hasad, Islamically, which is, which is like, you know, basically very negative in the way we approach these matters. And so when we say, may Allah put barakah in what he has given to you, we automatically negate all of those negative thoughts. And the amazing thing about asking Allah to put barakah in what someone, in what someone has, is that in actuality, this is like a, 
um, a dua that works on two levels. Because number one, as I said, when we, when we make dua for someone, we're asking for goodness for them, we're asking for Allah to increase them. So that's, first of all, fighting those negative feelings. Number two, if we had feelings of, you know, I deserve this, or I should have this as well, or I like it, I wish I had it, when you make a dua for someone, we know that the angels make the same dua for you, right? So if somebody has a nice car, I'm like, may Allah bless your car, and may Allah increase, may Allah give you an even nicer car. Not only am I making dua for them, I'm making dua for myself. And so what we're saying is we're attributing the goodness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that is what we're talking about when we say barakah. And barakah for us is an integral uh, aspect of everything that we do. As I alluded to in the beginning of this talk, oftentimes we, sometimes we don't realize it, but I think sooner or later most people in their life, they realize that work doesn't always equal success. Sometimes you can put in the work and you can put in the time and you can do everything right, but things don't go the way you planned. And so I believe that deep down inside, every human being knows that we are not fully in control. That the map, that what happens in, 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 in the world, what happens in our world, what happens in our life, at, on some level is beyond our control. So you can do everything right. You can do everything like by the book. You know, people say just do this and this and this and this and you will get the following result. But deep down inside, we know that sometimes that just doesn't work. And if that is the case, that we put in all the work in the world, we do everything right, and still we don't get the results that we want, it must mean that there is another factor that maybe we didn't account for. And that is our spiritual side of everything that we do. So as a Muslim, as a, as a believer, that is the aspect of, did Allah put barakah in what I'm doing? Did Allah add the goodness to what I'm doing? And that's why, you know, um, when we talk about barakah, we could talk about barakah in our time, right? So time has a certain amount of worth, it has a certain amount of value, um, and sometimes we get that value and sometimes we don't. For example, I'm, uh, I, I think most people here are, are students, right? Everyone's a student here? Most people? When you're studying uh, for an exam or you're, or you're uh, reading a book, sometimes you can open up a book and you can read a page and then read it again, and then read it again. And sometimes no matter how many times you read it, it just doesn't settle in your mind. Sometimes it's a paragraph, right? You read a paragraph over and over and over again, and you're like, wait, why, why am I not comprehending what this says? Sometimes you can read something, and the very first time you read it, you understand it, and it makes complete sense. Why does that happen? Well, one of the aspects, or one of the reasons that may happen is, maybe you did something to put barakah in your time that you were spending. Okay, so, for example, one of the things that happens uh, a lot when we talk about barakah and, and time is, we can take the example of, of prayer. Now, hopefully we all pray, right, five times a day. But that prayer isn't always the same. Right, the value of that prayer and how much our heart and mind are present in that, in that prayer is not always the same. Sometimes we pray quickly. Sometimes we're just trying to get it done. And sometimes we do that because there may be an external factor that is influencing how much time we spend in our prayer. So once again, going back to the example of studying, maybe you have a final in the morning, right? And you're counting down the hours. You're like, look, if I study now, I have, whatever, six hours of studying I can get done before I have to go take my, my final. And then you realize, hey, I didn't pray Isha. So I need to pray my Isha prayer, my night prayer. And you're kind of scrambling, right? Trying to cram it in, last moment. Some of you, not, not all of you, right? 
but you're trying to get it, get it all in, right? The, the, these six hours that you have. And then you're like, okay, I gotta pray, and you know, I'm gonna get my prayer done, but you pray very quickly. And even while you're praying, your mind is like on your exam. And you're thinking about like, I gotta study this, and I gotta study this, or like, I have, um, I don't know, 60 pages to cover, or 80 pages to cover, and I have very little time, and so you rush your prayer. And so, what happens, maybe because of that rushed prayer, you lose barakah in the time that is coming up. Because one of the ways we increase barakah, and I'm going to get to this, or actually the main way in which we increase barakah, is God consciousness, what is known as taqwa. Right? So, obedience to Allah and submission to Allah in general. But this prayer could add value to our time that maybe before didn't have value. So even though the prayer, and by the way, the difference between, and like I've timed this, right? The difference between a rushed prayer and a prayer that is prayed like calmly, when you're praying that prayer, like in our mind, we think it's like the hours of difference, right? And that's, that's one of the reasons why we rush, because we're like, I need, I need that time. The difference between a rushed prayer and a calm prayer, and I'm not talking about like difference in surahs, so I'm not saying like Surah Al-Baqarah versus like Surah Al-Nas, obviously that's like a three hour difference, right? But let's say you're going to recite the same surahs in the prayer, but it's going through the motions, right? Like so how, uh, how, um, how calmly you move from the standing position to the ruku'ah, and from the ruku'ah to the standing position and to sajda, how much time you spend in your sajda, and so on and so forth. I'm just talking about like the mechanics of the prayer. If you were to add up the difference, even in a four raka'ah prayer, we're talking about literally a couple minutes of difference. But the spiritual difference can be extremely significant. So even though like we think we've saved time, like I have more time, to, like once again, going back to, you know, cramming for a final, we're like, oh, I have more time now to study because I rushed my prayer, but the impact of that rushed prayer could mean that because we've lost barakah in our time, our time isn't worth that much. Then actually the Prophet ﷺ uh, gave us a very clear example of time and barakah. Uh, there is a dua, a prayer that the Prophet ﷺ made for his ummah. He would say, Allahumma barik fi ummati fi bukuriha. He would say, oh Allah, put barakah in my ummah or for my ummah, for my people. Fi bukuriha, meaning in the early portion of the day. And that why, that, that's why as Muslims, we believe that the early part of the day is a mubarak time, meaning a time that has barakah. And that's why one of the pieces of advice that I'll give you, um, especially as students, if you're really trying to get the most done, in the least amount of time, and you know, we're always short on time, the time after Fajr is a Mubarak time, is a time that has more Barakah, meaning we can get a lot more done in that time after Fajr, that early time. Because especially if we wake up with that intention, and we pray Fajr, and we ask Allah to put Barakah in our time, and that even an hour, subhanAllah, after Fajr can be worth more than hours of time other than that morning time. And this is something that I personally would do actually when I was studying at Medina. Uh, sometimes, you know, during finals week, and yeah, we had finals week in Medina as well, um, I'd be cramming, you know, uh, and I was cramped the night before the exam, even if I studied before. I'm like, no matter what I know, I gotta sit down the night of the exam and make sure I know everything again. And I would be up sometimes till like, you know, two in the morning, and then I would have to like refocus and say, you know what, if I sleep now, I can get up for Fajr. And even if I have like a lot to cover, which, which I'm like, look, I need five hours to cover or go over my notes. And you know, if I, if I sleep now, wake up for Fajr and pray Fajr, I only have an hour. I would pick that hour after Fajr over the four or five hours at night. Because I know that the hour after Fajr is going to be worth a lot more when it comes to, when it comes to me learning what I need to learn, and this how and I'm I'm sure I'm sure as students you have experienced this. Sometimes you can pull an all nighter, right? 
and you've got your gummy bears and your Red Bull. Is that still like the secret sauce? Because back when I was in college, I was like, the, if y'all don't know about this, I mean, I'm not encouraging you to do it, but that's just what I used to use, right? Gummy bears for the sugar and Red Bull for what? The caffeine. Yeah. So that's the secret sauce. Sometimes you can like practically be ODing on like Red Bull. And like your mind is racing at 100 miles an hour, but nothing is going in, right? You're awake because of the caffeine rush, but nothing seems to be going into your mind, right? And one of the reasons for that is to say, look, there's, there may be a lack of baraka in the time that we are spending, right? So time, baraka in time. We can have baraka, especially in our wealth in the money that we make. And that is why the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, Innama ghina, ghina nafs. He said, true wealth or true richness is the richness of one's self or, or one's heart. And what he's referring to is being content with what you have. Like that is true richness versus an actual amount. And that is why sometimes we'll see somebody can have all the money in the all the wealth in the world, right? But their heart is not at ease. And sometimes you can have someone who is not wealthy, someone who may be working like two jobs and struggling to put food on the table, but they are content with what they have and they live a happy life. It's not an easy life, but it's a content life. It's a happy life as opposed to the other person who may be wealthy and rich and they have all the money in the world, but what is the true value of that money if it doesn't bring wealth, if it doesn't bring uh, peace and contentment to one's heart? And so when it comes to our wealth, not we don't just look for an increase in wealth, which is, yeah, that's part of barakah as well, when we ask Allah to bless our wealth. Yes, we're asking Allah to increase our wealth as well, but also, Remember what I said earlier, we're asking Allah for goodness, right? What is that goodness when it comes to our wealth? Well, a couple of things. One is, yeah, it's contentment, but also it's rizq tayyib. It's, it's, it's the good type of sustenance, which means that it is halal, right? And it is not only halal, it is good for us. Because not all wealth that we have is good for us. And that is why we ask Allah to, to put barakah, to put blessings in our wealth. And I'll give you another example, subhanAllah, something that I have witnessed happen to people, right? People that I know. Look, it's very common um, when it comes to like wealth and property that because of the world that we live in where oftentimes wealth is valued above everything else, right? That we may turn to ways of attaining wealth that are not halal or not permissible in Islam. So, for example, you know, a person wants to buy a house, right? And they think to themselves, you know, all I need right now, like, I have a family, I have kids, and we're living in like a small apartment. If I had a house, we would be like a lot happier, right? Maybe there's like a, a shortage of room in the house, there's kids running around everywhere, and you know, home, like homeboy's wife is getting frustrated. Like if we only had a bigger house, you know, it'd be easier for us to handle the kids or whatever. We need more space, we need more space. We gotta get a bigger house, we gotta get a bigger house. Right, and he thinks to himself, you know, I don't want to get involved in something that Allah has not made halal. For example, interest or usury. I don't wanna take an interest-based loan. But he thinks to himself, you know, maybe the ends justify the means, right? So, and this has happened a lot. This is, I know it sounds like a hypothetical. It's not just a hypothetical. This is real life. It happens every day. So this person, this brother, who may be God conscious, right? But in this moment, he thinks to himself, look, I'll just, I'll take a loan, and then I'll try to pay it off as soon as I can. And Allah knows that I have a good intention, right? I'm just trying to have more space for my family. I'm trying to have more space for my kids. I want my family to be happy. I want my wife and my kids to be happy. I want to have a happy household. 
And so he decides to take that interest loan, right? And because of that loan, he's able to get the house. But the question he should have asked himself, and oftentimes people ask this question, but often when it's too late, or they're already like in the thick of it. The question is, will there be barakah in the house that I'm buying, right? And so sometimes, yeah, a person buys the house, but they find other problems happening in the house. So even though they have a bigger place, there is a lack of barakah in the house. And they may find other problems happening in their family. Like the whole reason he took this interest loan was to buy a bigger house so his family's happy. But they find that the, the added space in the house didn't make them happy. As a matter of fact, other problems crept into the family and the household, and even sometimes the relationships, all right? And so one of the reasons that, one of the reasons we, we try to live our, our life in a halal way is not just because Allah commanded us to do it, so we do it. Yeah, of course, that is the first and most important reason. But also, we understand, like as believers, we understand that if Allah has commanded something, that it's, it's not for Allah's benefit. Like, Allah doesn't need for us to, like, worship Him and obey Him, right? Whether we worship Allah or not, it makes no difference to Allah. Whether we obey Him or not, it makes no difference to Allah. Whether we do something which is just halal or haram, Allah is not affected in any way by it. But we know that if Allah has commanded us to do something, or Allah has prohibited something for us, it is for our benefit. It is for us. We may understand what it is. We may not. Or a lot of times, maybe later on, we're, we're, we will understand what the benefit of it is. Right? And so if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made something haram for us, we don't approach it from the point of view of, you know, um, this is something that has no benefit in my worldly life, which is how sometimes people treat these matters. Which is like, you know what? Live your life in a halal way. Yeah, your life is going to suck, but it's for the afterlife. Right? As a believer, our approach is no. When we live our life in a halal way, it's for the betterment, yes, of our afterlife. It's for Jannah, for paradise, and so on and so forth. But right here, right now, we understand that it's for the betterment of the life that we are living in. And that's a vastly different approach than saying, you know what, obey Allah just for the afterlife. Which, alhamdulillah, is enough, right? And if someone lives their life in that way, alhamdulillah, fine, you know, they, they have that purpose and that's great. But greater than that is to live your life for the afterlife and also for goodness in this life. There's a famous statement uh, by a scholar known as Ibn Taymiyyah, rahimahullah ta'ala. One of my favorite statements that he made, he said, Ala inna fi dunya jannah. Man lam yadkhulha, lam yadkhul jannat al akhirah. He says, Certainly in this life there is a paradise. Whoever doesn't enter that paradise will not enter the paradise of the hereafter. What is he talking about? That we live our life just fulfilling our desires and trying to find paradise on earth by just trying to do whatever we want to make ourselves feel happy? No. What he is talking about is that when we live our life in the obedience and worship of Allah, first and foremost, we find a Jannah, a paradise in this life. And so when we enter the paradise of this life, then we will enter the paradise of the afterlife. Right? That is what he is talking about here. And once again, I want to reiterate, the paradise of this life doesn't mean that life will be easy or that life will always be fun. But it means contentment and rest and ease and peace of the heart. And that's why you may have heard the statement of the Prophet وسلم, where he said, Inna deena yusal, that the religion is ease. Right? Or sometimes people say, the religion is easy. And sometimes the way people interpret that is, you know, Islam is supposed to be easy. 
I need, if there's something in Islam that I find to be difficult, I don't have to do it. Right? So if someone says, look, uh, you know, praying Fajr, like we have to wake up and pray Fajr. Right? That's part of our obligations. Someone says, look, didn't Prophet say Islam is easy? It sounds supposed to be easy, but getting up to is hard. You know, so obviously, God is not going to hold me accountable for something that I find to be difficult. But that is not what this hadith means. This hadith is talking about a ease on a much higher level than just ease of the body. It's talking about spiritual and emotional ease, and that leads to the ease of the afterlife. That is why Islam is ease. Not because you're always going to be comfortable in the worship of Allah. Anyone who worships Allah and tries to fulfill their obligations, they know this, right? It's not always easy, it's not as comfortable, and as a matter of fact, it's hard. And it's challenging. And you know what? It is supposed to be challenging. And that's why a lot of times I know we get the impression that for everyone else, Islam is easy, but for us it's difficult, right? And oftentimes the shaitan has a role to play in that, right? So when he's trying to make you feel bad about your faith, about your iman, right? He'll come to you and whisper to you and say, look, look at everybody else. They're all super Muslims and it's super easy, right? MashaAllah, it's so easy for that sister to wear hijab and that brother does this and that and, you know, he prays five times a day and he goes to the masjid. And you know what? Why can't you do it? Why is it, the shaitan will say, that you struggle with your prayer every single day. And the shaitan will help us interpret it in a way that we think to ourselves, you know what, you're right. It must mean that there is something wrong with me and my faith. And why does the shaitan want that from us? He wants it from us so we give up hope. And that's one of shaitan, by the way, that's one of shaitan's main goals when it comes to human beings. That we give up hope in Allah and we give up hope in ourselves. Right? And because he knows the only way he can defeat us is if we give up hope. Because as long as we have hope alive, and that's why hope, raja, is such an important aspect of our faith. Because hope means that we can make a mistake, and another mistake, and another mistake, and we can still come back to Allah. And that is why we have so many ayat of the Qur'an, so many hadith that remind us of that very matter. So we have the hadith Qudsi of the Prophet where hadith Qudsi, by the way, if you don't know, is when the Prophet tells us that Allah has said something. So this hadith where the Prophet he told us that Allah has said that my servant can go out and commit a sin and come to me and seek my forgiveness and I will forgive them. Wala ubali, meaning Allah says it means nothing to me. Like it takes nothing away from me to forgive this person's sin. Or, Bila Ubadi also translates to IDC, right? I don't care. Like Allah is saying, I don't care. It means nothing to me, right? And then Allah says, after that, the person can go out and sin again. And then they can come to me and seek my forgiveness and I will forgive their sin. And it, and it means nothing to me. Like it doesn't take anything away from me. And this happens a few times until Allah says, and this person can go out and keep sinning. And I will keep forgiving them as long as they seek my forgiveness, even if their sins were to reach the skies. Why is this narration there? It's there for us to keep hope alive, not in the easy times, because somebody who's having an easy time worshiping Allah, they don't need this hadith. Who needs this hadith? It's, the, it's the, the brother or the sister who's struggling with their faith. The brother or sister is having difficulty obeying Allah. The one who's having difficulty with their prayer. It's for that brother who's looking at his house and saying, my house is too small and I need more room for my kids. And it's difficult for me to live in a place like this. But the person perseveres, his brother perseveres because he knows, you know what? I don't want to put myself in a position where I may be disobeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I know that Allah, because of my obedience to Allah, Allah can put barakah, blessings, in the little space that I have. The little wealth that I have. 
the little that I have in my life. So wealth, when it comes to our wealth, barakah is important. Now and for the rest of our lives, there is a difference between living our lives to just have more stuff, just to have more wealth, just to see our bank account go up, versus living our life to increase our barakah in our wealth. And there's another place where barakah is important. Barakah in love. Did you know that's a thing? That even in love, we seek barakah. Right? And I would imagine most people here are single, right? So at some point in your life, maybe now, maybe later, maybe soon, inshallah, you're going to be seeking love. But what type of love do we seek? You know, when a person gets married, the Prophet said taught us to make a du'a for them, to make a prayer for them. And this du'a that we make for a newly married couple. Does anyone know this du'a? Does anyone have it memorized? Anyone? Raise your hand if you haven't memorized. Haven't been to a lot of weddings, huh? Okay, I will teach you this du'a. You ready? You gonna learn it? Yes? You gonna learn it? Yes? Okay. The du'a is the following. It's very easy. It's like three small phrases, sentences. Very easy. And if you can't remember it in Arabic, you can remember it in English. That's fine, inshallah. The Prophet Sallallahu said that to someone who's newly married, you say to them, Barakallahu lakuma. Right? And now someone's like, oh, I heard that Nasheed. I remember. Right? Alright. <laughs> Barakallahu lakuma. Wa baraka alaykuma. Wa jama'a baynakuma fi khayr. Three things. We say to the person, Barakallahu lakuma, meaning, may Allah make your spouse baraka for you. Right? So may your spouse be the, the means of adding baraka to your life. Barakallahu lakuma. Wa baraka alaykuma, and may Allah shower the two of you with baraka. Amen. fi khair, and may Allah bring the two of you together in goodness. So once again, may Allah make the two of you a source of barakah for one another. Right? Barakallahu lakuma wa baraka alaykum. And may Allah shower you. And what this means is you and your new relationship and the lives that you're about to start and what you're getting into here, may Allah put barakah, like shower it with barakah. Right? Because you need lots of barakah. And may Allah bring the two of you together in goodness. Why do we say this to a newly married couple? We say this to them because like everything else in our life, without barakah, I'm sorry to break it to you, but this ain't gonna work. Doesn't matter how much in love you are right now. Right? And people obviously are super in love in the beginning, right? For six months, nine months, a year, whatever. And then life gets real. Everyday stresses and, and so on and so forth and 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 and, and, and subhanAllah, I've I've said this to people like I've given like wedding talks before or whatever. And I always mention this du'a. And people are like, yeah, cool, cool, fine, like get on with it. Like we, we already like we're good, right? And I'm I'm thinking in my head, like obviously you're good now. But this du'a is yeah, it's for now, but most importantly, this du'a is for like five years into your relationship. Right? Or three years. Uh, one of my teachers in Medina, he would say, a marriage is tested at about a three-year mark, right? I don't know, that's just his experience, I guess. Like three years into the relationship, and then five years into the relationship, like those are like some, some points in which your marriage is, is tested, right? So when things are difficult, when, when things are getting hard, right? That is for that time we say, may Allah make you a source of barakah for one another. Because without, as we said, without barakah, there's something, there's a key ingredient missing. And that's why if you recall what I said at the beginning, we assume that you put in the time, you put in the effort, and that means success. How many people do we know who married 
the right person or married the one. Right? And then what happened later on? And it's, it's had a lot, you know, the, the divorce rate in, um, like generally, you probably heard like one and two, have you heard this? Yeah? Um, we would think that in the Muslim community, it's like way better, right? The stats are better. Like one in five, one in four, what is it? Does anyone know? The stats of the Muslim community, like in Muslims? Yeah, it's also one in two. There's like a there's like a two percent difference, maybe. It's like 48 percent versus like in the Muslim community, it's forty six percent, right? And this like I you know I've met since y'all are young and you're not married yet, or maybe you are, but you know a lot of you are going to get married. Inshallah, may Allah bless you with amazing spouses. I mean, and may Allah make you an amazing spouse for your spouse. I mean, say I mean, come on. Alright, I'm It's for your benefit. I'm, I'm married. I'm doing that. So, I usually like to make it real for people, right? So, how, how many people do you think are in the room right now? 75? So that means about 30 out of the 75 people are going to get divorced. Right? And subhanAllah... And I know you look at your friend like, not me, homie. Like, no. At this table, not me. Right? Everybody thinks it's not them. And I, look, look. Marriage, marriage, the reality of marriage is, like many other things in life, it's difficult. Right? It takes a lot of work. It takes a lot of sacrifice. It takes a lot of patience. And to have a lot, not only does it take... Uh, patience and, and sacrifice and, and so on and so forth it takes it on a it takes patience and sacrifice on a daily basis consistently and you let your guard down for a little bit and you'll start to see may Allah protect us we'll start to see cracks in our relationship right and so it's not easy right to make like someone when you see a couple that's been married for like 40 years and they're doing well which, which, by the way, is important because sometimes, especially in certain cultures, I don't want to say which cultures, right? But people stay married. They're like, oh, they've been married for 50 years, mashallah. Yeah, but it's been like a crap marriage for like 48 years. But because of the culture, they never wanted to get divorced. It's a horrible relationship. So for me, I'm like, that doesn't count, right? You're just living in like a terrible situation here, right? But culturally, it's like there's a stigma against divorce, so you never got divorced. I'm talking about... When you see a couple that's been married for 50 years, and that love is there. And not to say that the relationship is perfect, but they're in it together. That means that for 50 years, consistently, they have been putting in an effort, and they, and they both, because it doesn't, it doesn't work one way. It, that's, that's not how it works. No relationship survives when there's only one party you know, putting in the effort. 50 years, both of these people have been sacrificing. They have been patient. They have been putting the other before themselves. They have been putting the love for one another, sometimes above their own um, comfort, above their own need to be right, their own egos, consistently for 50 years. And a relationship like that, amazing. May Allah bless us all with relationships like that. But barakah is needed. And so at the very onset of this relationship, we say to them, we make dua for them, and we say, Barakallahu lakumah. Right? May Allah make you a source of barakah for your spouse. And may Allah send barakah upon you. And may Allah bring the two of you together in goodness. And we talked about goodness. Barakah is really goodness from Allah. Right? Al barakah min Allah. Barakah is from Allah. So when two people come together in goodness, that means they're adding barakah in their lives. And I'm just going to say one thing here, a little controversial, but IDC. Okay? When people start off their relationship, when they start off their marriage, right? So, inshallah, okay, haidad. There's another problem when people start off their relationship, and the relationship itself is how, right? 
That, I'm not going to get into that because that should be obvious. Islam 101, guys. Right? Islam 101. But I'm saying they want to keep a halal, so they're like, let's get married. But they start off their relationship in the disobedience of Allah. And it happens, all that disobedience happens in like two days. If you're Arab, if you're Daisy, like five or seven days, right? Seven days or five days of disobeying Allah. And, and subhanAllah, the justification that is given is, you know what, you only get married once. It's just one, it's just, you know, one time. And so I've seen people compromise their own morals, compromise what they, you know, it may be sometimes it's the girl, right? She's like, yeah, I don't want to do that at my wedding, but I know my husband wants to have whatever stuff at the wedding, right? Or my husband's family wants it, and it's just one day, so fine, you know what, we'll just do it. Or the guy does it sometimes, right? The guy's like, you know, I don't want to have like a DJ at my wedding and auntie's like throwing it down and stuff, right? Like, I don't know if that's the best way to, to like have my wedding, right? But maybe the girl's side is like, no, we got to have a DJ, we got to dance, blah, 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 all this stuff, right? And he says to himself, it's just one day. I just want to make my wife happy. I want to make my in-laws happy. It's just one day. But is it just one day? Or is this setting the precedent for the rest of the relationship? Number one, in the terms of in terms of barakah, right? How much blessing is going into the very beginning of this relationship, right? And second of all, for me, the wedding is a big telltale sign for the rest of the relationship. Because when it comes to compromise, the earlier in the relationship, the more willing we are to compromise. Right? The more willing we are to help the other person out. And so if one party says, no, I gotta have this stuff, even, even though you don't like it, and it's not right, or like you don't think it's right, but I gotta have it because it's my wedding day, and they're not willing to compromise at the very beginning of the relationship, then what's gonna happen later on? Right? And obviously, there's a compatibility issue here. Right? Maybe in the beginning of the relationship, homie said, fine, you know what, I'll, I'll let you have the type of wedding that you want to have. You know what, you want to spend $10,000 on the wedding, I love you, right? you're my soulmate, and so I'll spend $10,000. And it's fine during the wedding, and for the day, and for like the 200 Instagram pictures, it's great. But what happens down the line when a person feels that they spent their life savings on one day, or sorry, for day C, five days, right? <laughs> what happens? Well, real talk, resentment builds. And I'm not speaking, I, once again, it's not, these are cases that I have dealt with, where you know a guy has dropped all this cash on the wedding, and he's like, okay, he did it, fine, but then there was resentment there, right? And the resentment only grows. Let's say they run into financial issues later on, right? And he's like, I had $10,000 in the beginning of this relationship, and if it wasn't for that wedding, obviously he's not gonna say it to her, because especially in the beginning of relationships, people avoid uncomfortable conversations. Which is, by the way, the time to have uncomfortable conversations is at the beginning of the relationship. Because if you can't have it now, how are you gonna have it later? So they avoided that uncomfortable conversation, resentment. And it only grows, and it gets worse, until one day he can't take it anymore, right? And something like stupid happens, and he loses his mind, right? He's like, I waited for you at the restaurant for, for 20 minutes, why are you late? And he loses his mind. And she's like, what's wrong with you? I was just late, for, like, why is that such a big deal? Right, and then they go to a couple's counseling, hopefully, sometimes people don't, and then they figure out, He's had a lot of resentment towards her for years, right? And so, once again, barakah. Barakah means starting off, on the, starting off with the help of Allah. Starting off seeking barakah from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Likewise, you know, halal relationships versus haram relationships, right? There's the whole like halal haram aspect of it and disobeying Allah, which is important. 
But also, once again, remember the, the Jannah in this life. For our Jannah in this life, we need the Barakah of Allah. Not to say if a relationship starts off in a haram way, it cannot be rectified, inshallah, I can. But you don't want to put yourself in that position where, where the onset of your relationship is haram. And I often tell people like to kind of like shake someone and make it real for them. Because I, I believe in just I believe being honest with young people. Right. Like instead of just talking about the rulings, let's 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 talk about what these things really are. Right? So real talk, fine. You met, you had a haram relationship, and then at some point you got married. What happens when you have kids and your kids are like, so mom, how did you and dad meet? Right? Is it okay for me to, you know, meet someone like that? That's, that's the reality. Look, the reality of gender relations, by the way, um, one of the people's favorite topics to invite me to speak about is gender relations, right? Especially, I would say around like the high school, college age. There's always like problems in, in MSAs where like some people in MSA are like, you know, we need to be more social, right? Guys and girls, like why, why is there like this distance? And there's other people in the MSA that are like, we need to put a curtain up, we can never see the women, and the women should never see the men, and blah, blah, blah. And so there's always this, like every MSA. Hopefully not this one, right? I don't know. <laughs> but a lot of MSAs, right? It's always like gender, can you, shit, can you come to our university and we're going to host you, just talk about gender, gender relations. And they're hoping I'm going to be taking their side, right? Or they may know my view on a certain matter, and they're like, okay, we invite this speaker, and you know, we'll solve this problem. By the way, these problems don't get solved like this, right? It doesn't, it doesn't work like that. But when it comes to gender relations, I stop talking about gender relations. Because people are like, can you just set some rules, give us some, some rules about, about gender relations? And I'm like, no, because it's not about the rules, right? We have certain rules that, yes, we can say this goes back to Islam. But, like, if you're talking, like if a dude is talking to a girl, how much distance should there be? Has the Sharia defined it? Is it like four and a half feet? Four feet? Three feet? Two feet? What is it? Is there an exact distance? Yes or no? Yes or no? No. There isn't. But, in the Sharia, in Islam, we do find Allah telling us to not commit zina, right? Don't commit adultery. So once again, for me, like if I'm gonna talk about gender relations, I'd rather talk about the reality, like why are we talking about gender relations? Like let's just be real here. What we're talking about is let's not have sex outside of marriage. That's what we're talking about. Right? And it, but that's a, that's a difficult conversation with people like, let's just put up a barrier, right? That's a lot easier to talk about. Let's fight over like two feet or four feet. The reality is whatever conditions we put, whatever, like however we talk to the opposite gender, we are trying to fulfill the commandment of Allah. Allah said, Wala taqrabu zina. Allah said, do not even come close to adultery to sex outside of marriage. So what we're saying is, look, we want to protect ourselves to not put ourselves in a situation where we may be tempted. Now, what does that look like? Well, it doesn't have one exact picture. There's no one exact way to say, if you do this, it's not gonna happen. But there's one thing we can say for sure, that that does depend on your relationship with your Lord. It does depend on your spirituality. Right? And that's why for me, all like rules, rules when it comes to gender relations, none of them are important if we don't care about our relationship with Allah. Right? Look, we have certain countries, certain Muslim countries, where guys and girls are completely separated. Does do people not have sex outside of marriage there? They do. Right? It's just that it's people don't see it, right? It's not it's it's all hidden. It happens. Why? Because rules are not gonna stop just barriers, physical barriers, that's not gonna stop you. If someone really wants to fulfill their desires, they're gonna find a way. 
And so it has to go back to our spirituality. It has to go back to our taqwa. It has to go back to our relationship with Allah. Because our, if, we, if we are working on our relationship with Allah, it means we're going to make an effort. Not to say, once again, that we're going to be perfect. But it means that I'm at least going to pay attention to what's happening in my heart and soul. What my intentions are when I'm talking to somebody from the opposite gender. And for me, that's an important conversation to have. Right? That we say to ourselves, look, so the one piece of advice I always give people is, look, what are your intentions? Always check your intentions. Yeah, I'm talking to this girl, what are my intentions? I'm talking to this guy, what are my intentions? What am I feeling? Do I want this person to like me with the way I'm speaking to them? Right? That means being real and, and, and honest with ourselves. And I've heard people say, SubhanAllah, wait, 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 you went all the way to zina? We're just talking about having a conversation. We're just talking about drinking coffee. Like, where did zina come from? Well, let's look at the numbers. Right? The reality is, the vast majority of people with the norms that we have of the society, that, and, I, and I mean like a, a, uh, like a global society, because in my eyes, and I've traveled the world, um, the culture of the world is becoming more and more similar. We're living in a globalized world, right? So even though <clears throat> things may look different in Saudi Arabia versus America, right? So in Saudi Arabia, they have physical barriers. But in terms of our spirituality, this kind of like the world evens out, right? So Muslims across the world, um, there's a tendency for us to think that one place has better Muslims than the other. That's not how it works, right? Overall, Muslims are pretty much around the same type or same level, same type of faith, regardless of where they live, right? So the reality is that the vast majority of people, the numbers tell us, have sex outside of marriage, right? That means there's a there's there's a problem, and it's not and it's not going once again it's not going to be solved by rules, just rules. It means that we're not making an effort, right? So based off of the norms that that, we're, that that we have right now, the numbers tell us that there is a very high chance that a person is going to have sex outside of marriage. If they don't, if they don't care, like if they're not, if they're not worried about their spirituality, if they're not worried about their connection with, with Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, right? So I'm not. It's not a leap here to say, you know, the reason why we're careful when we talk to the opposite gender is because of we don't want to get into zina. That's not a leap. That's the reality, right? And once again, going back to the norms of our society here, I mean, for me. The Me Too movement was very telling of the society that we're living in, right? Because as Muslims, we're so, like there's certain things that, that shouldn't happen, right? So number one, like no, like normally, right? If you're not related to the person, if they're not your mahram, you shouldn't be touching them, right? And I know you'll say there's a different opinion amongst the scholars whether it's okay to shake the hand of the opposite gender. And whatever side of the argument you, fought, you fall on, fine. Right? Whatever your opinion is. But all of the scholars will, will agree that that should have become the norm for Muslims. That physical touch should be avoided. Now, and that's my opinion as well. Right? That the default should be that we don't touch the opposite gender. Right? We don't. And so, you know, subhanAllah, I remember um, a lot of these me, or actually one of these cases, right? But a lot of them are very similar to the Me Too cases. It's basically a woman saying, um, I, was, I was harassed, right? Um, and I was very uncomfortable with the situation. And then the guy comes and says, no, no, no. I didn't mean it like that, right? I just, this is just how I am, right? You know, the thing happening with, happening with Biden right now? What's, what's, the, what's the whole situation? He's like sniffing people's hair and stuff, right? And, and they're like, yo, that's uncomfortable, like stop. And he's like, no, 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 that's just how I talk to people, right? Like caressing people's shoulder and stuff. And he's like, no, no, that's just, that's just, you know, that's just how I'm old school, like guys did this, right? 
And it's like, as a Muslim, we would say, well, that shouldn't even be a question. Because there should be no physical contact to begin with. Right? Um, John Lasseter, you know who that is? Anyone know who that is? He was the head of Pixar at Disney. <clears throat> he, I don't know if he resigned or he got fired, but he's not the head of Pixar anymore because there were a, a, a few of the women who worked with him who said he would kind of like be inappropriate with them. And what was the whole thing? It, some of the cases were um, the women were saying like he'd put his hand on our thigh, right? And he'd put, her, put, our, put his hand like on our shoulder and stuff. And they're like, you know what? Now that everyone's, you know, the Me Too movement started, we must say we were not comfortable with that. We were never comfortable with that. And he came back and said, no, no, no. I was just like, that's just how I, you know, I'm just being friendly, right? Putting my hand on your lap, just being friendly. That's just how I am. As a Muslim, we would say, that should have never even been in a discussion. That should not even be in a discussion. Because as a Muslim, we're like, Yo, there's got to be, there's got to be some type of a, not a physical barrier, but at least a spiritual barrier where we say, look, as a believer, like, I don't get that close. Like, I don't do that. So there would never be that question. And subhanAllah, if we were living our lives in that way, we would find the barakah of that very issue. Right? There is goodness in, in, yeah, I know we think of it as restrictions. Right? I get it. Right? It's like, you know, guys and girls shouldn't just go and hang out or whatever and be close. I get it. You know, sometimes you're like, why is this them so why is this why is it so strict? Right? But we forget, once again, the, the when when we have these aspects of our faith, it's not about restricting us. Like Allah doesn't need for us to do something or not do something. It's just that we believe our Creator knows us best. He knows who we are, He knows how we behave, He knows what type of behavior patterns are not good for us. And therefore Allah has legislated these, these matters. And I'm going to share with you a story, and um, let's see how much time do I have. Yeah, I'm way over. Okay, anyway, last story, inshallah ta'ala. And I remember this story actually today. Um, usually I, I prepare my talks, and then the day of, um, I sit down and, and, and go over my talk again. Um, because I want, to, I want to remember in the context of, of where I'm speaking. So as uh, I came in today, I flew in today, and uh, the brother picked me up, and, you know, we're talking about college and so on and so forth. And it's been a long time since I graduated from college. So it's kind of like getting back in the zone, like getting back in, you know, what it feels like to be a college student. And I remember an incident uh, that happened with me in one of my classes. Um, one of my professors, and this is my senior year, um, and I was taking, I studied design, so one of my design classes, and these classes, because they were like senior level classes, um, they were very long, right? So two, three hours sometimes. And so one of my classes, I think it was my last semester or second to last semester, um, at the beginning of the semester, I realized that this class, the way, the time that it's at, like Maghrib comes right in the middle. And so I went to my professor, I said, hey listen, um, is it okay if I step out for like five minutes in the middle of the class? And it's, a lot of times we're just working in class, like we're on our laptops working, right? And he, and he said something very interesting to me. He said, look, um, he said, why, why, do you need to, why do you need to step out? And I said, look, I gotta pray. He goes, okay. I said, yeah, you know, I try to explain to everyone, look, uh, as a Muslim, uh, we pray five times a day, and the, every prayer has like a set time. So this time, like, you gotta pray, um, you know, at sunset, and we don't have a lot of time. And compared to other prayers, we have a lot more time, but this prayer we have less time, so I gotta pray at a certain time. And he goes, he goes, look, uh, I'm not gonna stop you from like, you know, practicing your faith or whatever, right? Like, you do you. He goes, but I'm just gonna say, I don't get it. I'm like, what do you mean? What, what don't you get? He goes, I don't get why God would need you to pray at a very specific time. He said, isn't God supposed to be like all powerful, all great? So why does God care? whether you pray now or later. And then he goes, as a matter of fact, why does God need you to pray at all? And subhanAllah, I knew that he was wrong, I just didn't know how to explain it to him. 
because a couple years before that, I wasn't even really Muslim, right? So I made a conscious decision to practice my faith, accept my faith and practice my faith, right? And I was like, uh, uh, and I tried to answer him, but I couldn't. You know, like someone says something to you and you got like a really good comeback, but it comes to you like 30 minutes later, all right? It's one of those moments. And I was like, uh, and he goes, you know, but it's fine. You gotta pray, pray. And then later on, subhanAllah, and this was further uh, solidified for me as I studied Islam. Right? I learned how to put this into words and to explain why we pray at a certain time. The reality is that he's right. God is all-powerful. He doesn't have any needs. He doesn't need us to pray at that specific time. Allah doesn't care. But Allah has legislated the prayer at specific times for whose benefit? Our benefit. And if you just sit and contemplate this matter, even for a couple of minutes, just a few moments, you begin to realize the wisdom in it. Now I'll just share one of the points of reflection I have on prayer. And that is the following. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created us all, human beings, with certain innate needs. Right? Some of them are obvious, we all get it. The need to eat and drink, we won't survive without eating and drinking, right? obviously. The need to be social beings, right? To live in a community, to live with other people, it's part of who we are. The need to be entertained, by the way, it's a real need, we all have needs to be, and that's why people who are like, all entertainment is haram, like you can't last, like you can only live that life for so long until you're like, wait a minute, maybe like I've taken Islam too far here, right? So yes, even in Islam, we are, there's entertainment, we're, we're allowed to entertain ourselves, I taught a whole class on this called the Thiq of Chillin, by the way, where we talked about entertainment and what's had out and what's not and so on and so forth. The whole idea of that class was to say, look, it's not that we can't entertain ourselves, it's just that we have certain boundaries that we shouldn't go outside of, right? Also, one of the needs that we all have as human beings is that we are all created to be spiritual beings. So we have spiritual needs, like our other needs. If we don't fulfill our needs, sooner or later, it's gonna affect our lives. We're gonna feel like something is off, like something's not right. And so a person may live their life without any type of spirituality, right? Without believing anything beyond themselves, right? They're like, it's me and my life and my dunya or whatever it may be, and that's it. But at some point, they may feel like something is missing. And that something is missing means, it means it's your soul calling out and saying, hey look, I have spiritual needs, you're not doing anything about it. And that's why sometimes people like break down. Even though they may have everything in the world, right? They may have been given all the wealth in the world. Um, what else do we desire? Recognition, they may have all the recognition in the world. They may be popular, everything. But the spiritual component is missing. And so they may break down. Right. So Allah knows that we have spiritual beings and therefore Allah has made it where we have certain requirements. Those requirements mean that that is the bare minimum we need to do in order to feel spiritually fulfilled. That's what our fara'id are by the way. The fard, the fard aspects, the obligatory aspects of our faith are the bare minimum we need to do in order to feel spiritually fulfilled. Beyond that, it's extra, right? We can get more spiritual. We can increase in our, in our worship and feel a heightened sense of spirituality, which many of you have felt in the month of Ramadan, right? Do we have to pray Taraweeh in Ramadan? Yes or no? No, we don't. It's not an obligation. But we pray it. Why? Because we're seeking a heightened sense of, sense of spirituality in the month of Ramadan, right? So, those four aspects of our deen, that's the bare minimum Allah knows that we need in order to feel spiritually fulfilled. And Allah knows that if He left it up to us, because once again, my professor was like, why does it matter when you pray, right? And straight up, there are Muslims who are, are like, yeah, that, that makes sense. So you know what? I'll just go home at the end of the day and pray all my prayers together. God wants me to pray five times a day. I'll pray five times a day, but all together. Right? Because why does God care? 
But the reality is that Allah has knows that if He had not legislated those five prayers at those specific times, we would let it go. And then we would feel like our spiritual needs are not being fulfilled. And that's why the Prophet he asked the companions, he said, what would you say of a person who goes and takes a bath in the river or bathes in the river five times a day? Would there be any dirt or filth upon them? And the companion said, no, he, he would be so clean. Right, five times a day, homie goes and takes a shower. Right? How clean would you be? Very clean. And the Prophet said, likewise is the salah. Likewise is the prayer. If you're praying five times a day, that means at least five times a day we are refocusing. And we're asking ourselves, I, we're telling ourselves, I need the barakah of this prayer in my life. Right? And that is why the Maghrib has to be prayed in Maghrib time. So I wish I could have said this to my professor back then. I tried to find him on Facebook, I, I couldn't. <laughs> but the last thing I'll say is this, inshallah ta'ala. And that is that as we, we live our, I, and you know, when I was discussing this topic um, with your MSA, um, I told them, I said, look, I, I do believe that most people understand that just taking the worldly means is not enough. That deep down inside, we all understand that there has to be something else, right? So for me tonight, is just about refocusing all of us and saying, look, deep down inside, you understand that the results are not in your hands, that you can do everything and still not get the result, and that's why that spiritual component has to be there. It has to be part of who we are. And that's why the Prophet Isa, alayhi salam, Jesus, he said, وَجَعَلَنِي مُبَارَكًا أَيْنَمَا كُنْتِ He said, Allah has made me mubarak wherever I may be. Mubarak meaning what? He's the source of goodness, right? He brings goodness wherever he may be. And he helps people, he's there. And that's why we wanna be Mubarak as well. That when we are in a, in a room, we're in a gathering, or somewhere, and that's the question I usually ask people. I say, look, as a Muslim, are you a Mubarak person? Do people feel that you help bring goodness into their lives? And sometimes that's just a reminder. Right? And we need each other, like as a community, alhamdulillah, like when I see MSAs, it's beautiful. Because I know that on our own, there's times where we're not strong enough. Right? You're with your friends, and it's that one person who says, hey, maybe let's pray. Right? Maybe this is wrong, maybe we shouldn't backbite right now, maybe we shouldn't talk about this person, it's wrong. And you know what, we're going to lose barakah. And so our, our, our friendship, our gathering, whatever we're doing together, will not be blessed. And we're going to lose out on any benefit or the benefit that we were getting from this gathering. So I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to put barakah in your MSA. And I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to put barakah in each and every one of your lives, our lives. And I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us a means of barakah for each other. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. سبحانك اللهم وبحمدك أشهد أن لا إله إلا أنت أستغفرك وأتوب إليك